I'm Helen Hughes and this is a talk about my practice. Uh, my practice is a process-based sculpture practice with materiality at its core. I have a commitment to materials. I started to look closely and develop a fascination with modern materials as screen presence expanded to dominate so many areas of daily life. I'm conscious of a growing and far-reaching divorce from materiality evolving alongside the development and expansion of virtuality. I choose to work with familiar mass manufactured materials and commodities such as polystyrene, plastic, resins and balloons. And I take these elements and rework them with a more human sensibility to draw out latent qualities and latent beauty within the materials. My approach to reworking them might involve removing, adding, moulding, casting, recasting, pouring, inflating, deflating, balancing and pressurising so that the resulting forms don't have a homogenous appearance like that of industrial products. So sometimes I'm disguising and sometimes revealing so that materials and objects begin to mimic each other and other things. Through a practice of perpetual experimentation with these materials, I've developed over time unique processes that have led to a complex kind of convoluted but intimate human connection with modern materials. I'm drawn to working with balloons in my practice for the following reasons. They have intriguing structural and sculptural surfaces. They're generally full of air, often human breath. They're a fragile commodity, but they seem to be everywhere. They're universal. They're non-permanent, but I'm semi-preserving them with resin, so obsolescence is implied. They're associated with the life's celebrations of milestones. They're always expiring. Their prevailing aesthetic is one of instability and impermanence. I see my practice as a reflection on consumerism or an expansion of the industrial process where I'm trying to humanise a kind of dehumanised behaviour that I see as linked to mass manufacturing. I work with a lot of expendable materials and commodities that come out of modern mass manufacturing systems. I'm trying to humanise aspects of the material world through manipulating, extending and reworking traditional sculptural processes in an examination of the relationships of the individual to surrounding systematic structures. And by that, I mean the repetitive processes that are required to produce multiple units of the same thing, like a car or a cardboard box. I make functionless objects which look a bit like they've been cast out of the normative order. For example, altered balloons, eternally preserved, are often exhibited semi-collapsed in an in-between state, somewhere between buoyant, potent symbols of consumerist progress, celebration and revelry, and leftover flaccid inert remnants. Some observations by people looking at this work um, it looks like a unit that's gone wrong in a production factory or like something that has disrupted an industrial process or something you might find flung or hidden somewhere in a factory so that the worker who screwed up didn't get in trouble for making an error on the production line. Mostly these forms continue to change and contract after I'm finished working with them and I set up this kind of after effect at the beginning by selecting precarious expendable materials and employing spontaneous improvised processes that are difficult to control. So I know from the outset that the finished work will continue to evolve and contract. They're not stable. I'm deliberately setting in motion a type of built in obsolescence, a fundamental basis or code for capitalism. So I'm borrowing or mimicking that paradigm. I like to think of these forms performing a kind of duping. They're seductive, smooth, glossy sheens, luring to foreground the inherent false exchange value of purchase. So I'm trying to connect a pervading aesthetic of instability and impermanence in these forms with the workings of marketing and consumerism. Uh, when exhibiting the work, I acknowledge this openly by putting up signage indicating that the work deteriorates over time if it's for sale. Here's an old work of mine from when I first started to work with balloons. I've been using balloons in my practice for a long time. This work was, unusually for me, uh, purposefully interactive. So you could press through the holes with your fingers, you could press the balloons. And just to show a bit of process here and give a sense of what it's like working with balloons. So obviously there's some unpredictability, stress and tension going on. In relation to processes that I use to make this work, I improvise my own unique processes, which aren't very set or designed. Each result is different and cannot be reproduced exactly. I'm drawn to taking on willful and unpredictable materials that are very quick acting and difficult to control and work with. I use them in a way that they're not supposed to be used. Then I spontaneously react to the unexpected and unknowable way they behave and act when they're used in a way they're not designed to be used in. 
So for this work, I made bags, which act loosely as improvised moulds, and I used them to cast these lozenge shapes. The actual material I used here is an industrial expanding foam, which is a very willful material, and two of us had to react in a kind of impromptu, unplanned way to exert enough physical bodily pressure to impact the foam as it forcefully expanded in whatever way it needed to when the chemical solution set off. So a central part of this process revolves around these moments when the catalyst in the solution sets off. I use very quick setting materials, so there is little time to impact or influence the natural behaviours of these materials and the route they're designed to take. So part of the process is an intense, focused, very physical battle of wills between me and my chosen materials, and it can be quite chaotic. So the studio can feel like a kind of battlefield at times, but there's always consideration for a balancing of forceful physical action with the degree of tenderness. So you could say that I improvise a range of experimental processes that are faithful to the materials kind of being let loose. So this element I made on the shelf here and presented it in the exhibition as it had developed and expanded in process of making it in the studio. This is another iteration of expanding foam work, similar process used here. You can see the indentations from the physical pressure that I was asserting on the bag of foam, leaning and pushing my full body weight against it as it expanded. This is a studio shot where you can see the creasing resulting from the physical pressure more clearly. And another studio shot. And again, this is experimental work in the studio. Uh, when experimenting and preparing work in my studio for exhibitions, I make versions and iterations of elements. I bring everything to the exhibition site then and edit back. So some of this work looked very different in its final presentation. By engaging with the materials in such an involved physical way, I think about countering the modern trend towards a divorce from materials that's keeping pace with the expansion of virtuality. I'm going back to the body and its ways of understanding. And I'm thinking about humanizing aspects of the material world and of probing homogeneity. I'm taking machine produced finished stuff and I'm trying to insert a role for myself in the activation of these forms. I'm thinking of forcing them out of a kind of mass inertia and also discovering and revealing a latent beauty that exists in regular mass manufactured commodities and materials. And looking at retail references in the work, writer Joanna Laws compared this work to patterned glassware with an ultra glossy resin veneer which coolly exudes a 1970s aura of gaudy ornaments somehow smuggled into a gallery setting. Sometimes I fabricate simple Ikea-esque plywood tables on which to present the work to mimic forms of display associated with boutique interiors and the fetishistic seductive marketing of products. Here's the bright cerise pink of the background again, reflecting attractively coloured retail environments. And again here, a shiny material holding a nondescript piece of plastic catches the light as it whimsically rotates. So basically, I'm a bit obsessed with the seductive surfaces of retail. But although I'm using a lot of plastics and resins, which are obviously troublesome environmentally and have a dubious legacy, I feel my relationship with these materials is in contrast to when we generally think of society's flippant relationship with overproduced throwaway plastic commodities. For example, the average consumer with a plastic coffee cup. But of course, this is all changing now. But I do borrow a lot of my inspiration from mass produced consumer goods and dispensable packaging. This is expanding foam in cellophane, which ended up looking like shrink-wrapped meat by the time I finished squashing and pressurising it to contain it. Writer Robert Herbert McLean talks of these shiny reflective paints and elegant metal sheens presenting as useless decorations that dupe you by the sheer virtue of their inventiveness. I love this notion of duping in relation to consumerism and toying with the previously mentioned false exchange value associated with the purchase. I try to be facetious in relation to consumerism and setting up this false exchange value. So the lure of glossy sh synthetic things that are perpetually deteriorating. I see this as a kind of upturning of a capitalist premise in that consumer objects are supposed to deteriorate and need to be replaced or updated or upgraded. And traditionally art objects are supposed to last. Here's a slow motion video of a part of a process that I use a lot. Uh, slowing down the process of air escaping from the balloon ended up sounding a bit violent. Sometimes instead of bursting the balloons, I let them deteriorate so that the energy and tension of the semi-inflated ones is gone. This flower-shaped form is achieved by pouring hot resin over an inflated balloon, which then sets. 
and I presented it here on a broken piece of cast resin as a shelf substitute. The title of this work is Grace, Space, Pace and it's a by byline taken from a Jaguar car ad. So while I employ mass-produced goods as materials, I also find and borrow my titles from a number of typically mass media sources. I like to source and use advertising taglines as a kind of inverse en endorsement. Another example, in the past I used the title for the men in charge of change. This is an archaic tagline which still appears on the front of the business magazine Fortune. So I'm taking these curious messages from branding culture and I'm irreverently coupling them with the, the works which consist of mass manufactured materials that I have displaced or interrupted on their designated route. I've already mentioned why I'm drawn to working with balloons. So to say what it is about working with resin, I can achieve a nice ultra glossy finish like a veneer. I like this synthetic plasticity you can get. It's kind of fetishistic and glorious. These are qualities that for me link to consumerism and the synthetic quality and ultra glossy finish is in line with the smooth styling of commodification. For me, there's an inherent loss in the notion of becoming assigned to broad demographic groups from marketing purposes, an individual as well as an ethnic loss that comes from too pure an alignment with the spirit of global capitalism. And this kind of an erasing of uniqueness, which is something that I try to probe and counter in the work. So with this perpetual experimentation that is my practice, lots of new processes are attempted and lots of discoveries are made by accident. I embrace mistakeism in my processes and errors and imperfections. I'm conscious that I'm working towards unknowable results and almost enticing failure, unlike, say, a factory producer. Each element is made using an improvised instinctive process which feels intimate, spontaneous and new each time. In a practical sense, it might involve simply cradling a wobbly piece of cellophane very loosely and spontaneously, moving my body in tune with it, delicately adjusting it as the material finds its way. Or equally, it might involve pressing myself as forcefully as I can to impact and divert the power of an aggressively active chemicals in an, in an industrial expanding foam. So my interaction with these sophisticated materials that have been cleverly engineered from mass production is spontaneous and makeshift. And I sometimes develop a sense of protectionism for the nondescript pieces of plastic that result and I suppose fit into a category of what everyone frowns upon in the environment today. This is made using a large balloon with a six foot diameter. I used a plug in leaf blower to inflate it. Uh, there are obvious complications with working with a balloon of this size in this way. It's difficult to work with as it's bigger than me and bigger than the span of my arms. It's light and full of air so there's a lot of movement in it. It's hard to pin it down. It doesn't want to sit still and have heavy material poured on it. It moves around with the weight of the material if it's even slightly uneven. So it can be frustrating, but I like this aspect of working with these materials as well. Um, conforming to these restrictions prompts pra my practice to venture into unexpected areas. So control is inherently limited in this kind of perpetual experimentation that has evolved to become my way of producing things. Things go wrong a lot and lots of wastage and wreckage is produced along the way. I sometimes think about my processes mimicking a factory worker who can't keep pace with the production rate of the conveyor belt. Someone I spoke to once said the way I work brought to mind for him the famous scene from the 1800s movie Modern Times with Charlie Chaplin. So here's a clip of that. The structure of my works are largely devised by the materials themselves, their nature, characteristics and behaviour and the way they move and collect the material and facilitate its curing. With input from me largely restricted, it's a fairly democratic or equal flow between me and my materials as we kind of to and fro in the short time window allowed by the materials. Over time, my relationship with the materials has grown and developed to allow some fine tuning of certain aspects of the process. 
and might be able to vary slightly the amount of control and chance within the parameters of their characteristics. So I'm editing with the knowledge that I'm building up. I come up against a significant amount of technical challenges using things as they're not supposed to be used and this leads to plenty of frustration. Frustration also brings an element of humour. Quoting Robert Herbert McLean, writing about this work, he says, they prompt hilarity, acting as levelling devices, bringing in equality to all who wonder bemused at them in befuddlement at their intangible eloquence. They act up, all goonish, like a mute pulling a funny face. At times I've ventured off from my makeshift intuitive processes to see about using more traditional sculpture making skills, such as mould making and casting. So this is a proper fibreglass and silicon jacket mould. So a strong, long lasting mould that can be used many times to repeat casts in an exact way. And so it's obviously very different to say a flimsy, loosely cradled cellophane mould that I would more typically use. Um, so it's full control way of working with a stable, reliable, repeatable process that facilitates exact reproductions and a big contrast to my usual ad hoc way of producing. So here's a wax cast and a clay cast and resin. And this is back to the looser improvised processes. Another facet that has been emerging as this work is presented in different exhibition contexts and that I've been reflecting on is the idea of theatricality. These works seem to lend themselves to a kind of heightening of the drama of their synthetic glory as they're presented in, for instance, blacked out spotlit gallery spaces. A review by writer Catherine Harty of this show stated the space acts as a stage set waiting to be activated, a terminal beach, deflated beach balls, petrified balloon sausage dogs, air in, air out, pumped up, sucked out. Materials are balanced, hung, propped, leaned, inflated, deflated, painted, stripped and tied. And from my perspective as the maker, the idea of a scene requiring activation rings true. The work has come about through quite physical processes in the studio. So when it reappears in the exhibition context, it's nice to think of it being activated again by the physicality of the viewer. For me, the viewer arriving at the scene, as it were, in the context of an exhibition, has some parallels with the experience of the consumer in a retail showroom or the theatre goer engaging with props on a stage. Quoting Robert Herb McLean, he said, I imagine Helen inversely scaling up with showrooms that are like temporal theme parks, like Ikea on Asset. He also referred to these glossy, fetishistic things as maybe resembling ornaments, but a bit more uncanny and disturbing. The theatricality of the lighting gives a kind of unifying sense to all of the work here and a sense of anticipation and discovery for the viewer. On the concept of touch or touching and thinking about virtuality in screens and how instinctive and natural we've become about touching interfaces in order to impact action and how our daily interactions are increasingly conducted on an interface rather than the actual. I wonder whether this type of immediate access through touch has seeped out to extend beyond just screens. In my experience, the tactile and seductive nature of the materials I use seems to prompt the viewer to want to touch them, even in an exhibition setting. This work had a hole punched in it by a kid at the exhibition. Their scale relates to the human body and the shiny pigments of the glass or porcelain-like veneers adds to their tactility. In our increasingly virtual world, I feel a level of anxiety is perceptible around the potential for digital objects to take us away from the body and its ways of understanding. I'm interested in speaking to that impulse to touch in relation to understand something in a world where tactile understanding is less available at the tip of our fingers because it's hidden behind digital coding. For example, a boiler in a house can now be operated on a phone from 100 miles away using a Wi-Fi connection and a remote wireless thermostat with unprecedented ease where it used to be the case that you had to go to the physical boiler and light a match. With so much meaning and content in our lives now in the virtual realm, I wonder whether the impulse to touch the smooth, glossy veneers of this work connects to a more primal impulse to understand forms through touch and to get a sense of how they may have come into being. Or is this just an extension of our everyday practice of touching screens and other interfaces? 
Since we were babies, we have discovered the world through touch, a natural instinct that begins at birth. Grasping toys, chewing them, crawling, playing on the floor, all our explorations with touch. And working in studios over years, I've many times set up tables to work on and efficiently carry out my processes, but I inevitably end up working back on the floor. Making work on the ground like this, I think, resembles play and maybe a playfulness that carries through into the finished work. And of course, touch has taken on a new significance since COVID-19 arrived, which has altered the way we touch and left us with an intensified awareness of what we touch. The requirement to keep our distance is at the forefront of our minds now for survival reasons. This new requirement of being held at a physical remove from things puts more constraints on the body and further negates its instinctive ways of understanding. A final quote from Robert Herbert McLean when we had a conversation in my studio surrounded by lots of works in progress. He said, like a vase with its centre of gravity smashed out, the studio suddenly becomes a fashion outlet and a live exhibition space of full commodity fetishism wherein Helen and I are waiting for a fantastic model to come out of an adjacent interdimensional changing room wearing one of Helen's sculptures as a scarf. And to finish... A video insight into the experience of working with the materials I choose to work with and how a sense of humour is needed. This, I guess, is my Charlie Chaplin moment. 